<clears throat> cool. So you want to share the screen or you want me to share the screen? Then send me the final item you don't have. I can share it. Okay, cool. <laughs> Ooh. Hi. This looks awesome. Uh, uh, you are so glad to have you there. It's our present. Thank, thank you. you. It's, it's nice to meet you guys. And I'm, I'm, thank you to Nassim for inviting me. I'm happy to be here. I'm looking forward to seeing your music. This is my honor. <laughs> Oh no, it's mutual. Uh, it's 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 totally mutual. I, I, I love it. What one of my, my favorite or my, my favorite thing about grad school is meeting people from all over the world and, and meeting Nassim and getting to meet you guys and I, I think this is really cool. So I'm super happy thanks. and honored to be here. <laughs> I wrote a a piece for um, I was just uh, sorry about my English is not so good, but I want to Explain my music and maybe it's just it's like a practice for us to speak in English. Uh, sure. I decided to I decided to write a music for uh, a small a small teeny bell. This one. Mm -hmm. And I don't know you see the video that I share in my Dropbox uh, or in my. Google Park, that's a planet that I put it in my Dropbox and uh, I just think about, maybe I expect to share that with you. We can share share it with you. Whatever you like, I think, I think Peter had watched that. But if you if you'd like, you can you can also show it. I don't want. I I haven't seen it. Uh, I I wasn't. I didn't watch it in advance, so we can see it now if that's okay. okay. Cool. Yeah. <clears throat> I'm showing it. Music. I'm best now. I can to see it. So you need to. Talk for a bit because I need to find it. Yeah. Um, uh, can can I, we can we look at the yeah. score again? Can you share the score again? Uh, uh, Nassim, want to share that? Uh, you can start hola. sharing the score, and then I will put it when it's ready. Okay. Can you, um, Payman, can you tell me um, what each staff is? Because I'm having, I see channel one, one through ten. And then. Uh, I divide my score to one, two, to five uh, pieces that uh, in the first one I have ten, chunk, ten channel that uh, uh, in, uh, and the second one is the volume, this mm -hmm. one. It's, uh, the volume that's the game volume that uh, all of the process can be uh, more loudly or uh, and the second one the third one is about the algorithm where the difference of meters mm -hmm. uh, tempo. Uh, in the process in the process we have some uh, time to record that sound mm. and showed it and uh, another time in with my music mm -hmm. and uh, <clears throat> last one is about the process that I, I put some effect on mm. my music i see okay if you uh, like um first kind of it. share it <clears throat> you, you, you want me to Sorry. share the clip if you yeah yeah okay
Do you see it now? No. Yep. Uh-uh, my bad. I always forget this. That is a quick... Okay. Here we go. It's that planet that I inspired me to show, to write the music. I think all of the uh, top part of the planet, like a uh, bells. Uh, I used uh, sea sound filters for that. Sea sound cute. مرسی این بقیه خواهم توضیح میدم آره قطع کنیم این It's uh, my intro that I have uh, about uh, eight meter So was, was uh, just so I understand they, was what we just heard uh, part of this score? Yeah, we hear the, just the, uh, the intro yeah. From <clears throat> until uh, second uh, second minute. Uh, I have here. Yeah, I have uh, eight panels that uh, with different meter, and they are uh, certain rhythm that they uh, played in a loop, but after uh, a little. Uh, Second, to start that, uh, we have uh, some music. They have music like uh, it is um, maybe dance music, and you have uh, a lot of orgu, orgu chimsha, rhythmic pattern that uh, made in itself. Uh, we uh, we show the music uh, until uh, minute two, and in this process we have a crescendo in my music, and uh, the tempo at all is uh, changed from uh, sixteen to two hundred seventeen. Uh, the 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 accelerando was very clear. The, the the kind of accumulation and and speed up that that was very audible. So that I think that really worked. That um, that tempo change arc was was very effective. Yeah. Um, and, and I have an uh, effect that is called P one that uh, I used an effect to make the sound music uh, to uh, noise music that this sound. It's like that. I yeah, I heard some of that. There was uh, after, there, there were bell sounds, but there was also some kind of crunchy, dry sounds in the mix. So that's that. Okay, good. From the uh, second minute, uh, we have another pattern like that. That all of the channel with each other, and they, we have a decrescendo there, and to have a, like a. Uh, 
uh, bridge to the development part. In the development, we, I have uh, this part that uh, like a pattern that they play, and just I want to tell about something that uh, this ten channel is sort of around the uh, evidence that want to uh, have some noise there and some uh, channels there. And it's like a uh, surround sound, and uh, in the, in this part we record uh, two pieces and uh, the first one is that that we uh, use them that we stretch that sound and it uh, make a different sound from this one from the, this one part and another one is that we record all of the music in this part one from one twenty two one fourteen. Yeah, uh, I use them uh, like uh, I stress them with a program in uh, Csound Cute, and I use them in some parts. Uh, so another time, I record that stressed uh, pattern, and I stress another. I it. I use its converse like COR4. R4 is like that, this one, and I convert it. I, the music is uh, from the end, is playing too. Mm -hmm. So, At this, Payman, yeah. can, I, can I ask, what do you like about, about the stretching effect? What is it that appeals to you about taking a recording and stretching it? Yeah, it's, it's giving me a new sound. It's like a develop, like a variation of the sound that I used. And it is uh, different in pitch and also different in its uh, quality. And maybe resonance. Mm -hmm. um, at the end, I used uh, uh, the same bridge to like a coda in my music. And at the same time, I use another uh, program. This one is and this one is delay. It is multi, multi delay, and we have a more strange sound there. So it it looks awesome, and it sounds great. What 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 you played? Um, I have a couple questions. W will the final version? It'll be an electronic piece for for multiple channels. Is that right? it's not something that would be played live, right? It's pre-recorded. Uh, it's uh, like music that play at the first, and uh, all of the process like uh, live electronic music. Mm -hmm. They are a loop that play, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and another uh, this volume, this other gig, and this right. record them. They are electronic action. Yeah, w would you want it to be multiple channels? Like, like I don't know if that's an option for this for this class, but would you yeah, want it to be surround have, sound? We have ten channel. Yeah. Around me. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And, uh, at first, uh, I decided to make some uh, Iranian music, some sort of tone, mm -hmm. uh, instead of this bell. But but I decided to use just bells and uh, have my first um, my first practice composing for just uh, how can I say just the noise for a small no I think that's a really great approach actually I was thinking that you've kind of limited your resources in a way to a very specific set of just the single bell sound and I think often um, I think that actually is a really good idea with creating a piece is if you just like limit yourself in some way, because then it makes you really explore all the different possibilities inherent in that one little thing. And like, like if, if, if you, you like the bell is a very beautiful sound, it's, it's very clear and resonant. Um, but if you were writing for like a bunch of different instruments, you might just use it as a bell and that would be as much as you explore that sound. But if you're making a piece for only the bell, then you have to like, you have to 
figure out ways of like making that sound different. Um, so I definitely think you're um, you're getting there with the spatialization. I, and even in headphones, I could hear the left right, and that was really yeah. effective. That, it, that was a nice uh, like effect. Uh, actually, that is the sound sound. Uh, that is a studio sound, mm -hmm. and I have uh, another file that I maybe I sent it to Nassim. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, but and if you uh, could uh, upload uh, all of them on the sketches, I could have them available. Yeah, but, but I want to put all of them on that, that same uh, uh, sound that I sent to Nassim is that about this uh, two second, uh, mm -hmm. two second at the first, and I have no uh, play this part yet. Gotcha. Yeah, yeah. I didn't hear the second half. So, so um, I just have more questions. And Nasim, I'm not, I'm not watching the time. So maybe just let us know if how much time I, I should go uh, for here. We but, have about four minutes. Left. Okay. Then great. I um I have a few questions and comments. Then uh, payment. Uh, one is I, I the video that we just saw with the the bell tree the planet that you said the 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 tree with all the bells that was rotating, um, yeah. was was very beautiful to me and very captivating. Um, are you? I have a question about the form of this piece. How, how did you? Um, you know, looking at the score, it's very clear. You've got kind of a two part. You've got this introduction section, which has this kind of steady accelerando that I heard. And then I see the second section, which we didn't hear, uh, but you're you're using the recordings and doing the time stretching. Um, how did you how did you design this form of this piece? This idea of having like two sections and kind of the shape of each section was it inspired by like the shape of the bell or any kind of like physical system or idea or w how did you come up with your idea for form? Mm -hmm. Really, I just kind of... uh, about the cla uh, classic form mm -hmm. that I have a A that like right. uh, that yes and the B it is my develop and mm -hmm. that is and we have in the B sometimes we uh, re replay uh, mm -hmm. some patterns from the B on C in the museum we have uh, I think I think we have a. Uh, Get test. We have yeah. a um, unity. You mean? A kind of um, yeah. Yeah, unity. Yeah, yeah. I did we hear the recording that we heard? Was that all of the A section? Yes, it was. It's so the A my one kind of comment and thought is that. Um, well, I wonder. Do you want the A section to? Tell me if this makes sense. Do you want it to like start in one place and evolve and become something new? Or do you want it to kind of go in an arc and then come back and return to kind of where it started? Does that make sense? Because I, I heard it as the second. I, I, heard, I heard the bell rhythms and they were kind of accumulating and resonating more and more and speeding up and it kind of like increased in intensity and then it came yeah, back down and it kind yeah, of... I, uh, I want to have a, go ahead. I have a missing uh, pattern. Yeah. I I got this uh, uh, this kind of written from uh, an African music mm. that mm -hmm. each of the women they play the uh, its own meter and all of them make uh, another polymeter uh, and mm -hmm. other and they have at the same time. Uh, Around the music, yeah. Like I have, I have a, a, a metric pattern that the first one is uh, sound from this side, and that, that another one, another sign. We have some mm -hmm. sound, and at first it is not, uh, it is empty. We have just two sound, ding ding, like here, until second, I think second twenty. Uh, and after that, we, it, we it use another uh, belt and it's full of sound until uh, second minute. And it is full of energy in second minute. And have the decrescendo there. Yeah. 
I heard I heard the polyrhythm. I heard I heard them come together to make it sounded like a three over two the African um like bum 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 da bum 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 da bum 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 I heard that uh, kind of emerge. Um I think it would be cool. I don't know you could you could play around with the with the way this A section ends. To me it kind of felt like it built intensity and then it kind of just like it ended. It kind of went back to where it came from. And I wonder if um I wonder if it could be something more where like it builds and builds and builds and then it becomes something totally new. I don't know if that appeals to you, but like, like, it, like it, it kind of seems like it starts with a lot of like individual elements that kind of come together and become something collective. Maybe that collect, yes. yeah, maybe that collective entity could have like a collective transformation in some way, as opposed to like, it kind of sounds like all the individual things come together and then they kind of come back apart a little. That's just how I heard it. Maybe they could come together and then like become something together, like or like yeah. like a, a like a unified rhythm that they all start playing together or something. You, you know what I mean? Just so so it feels like it's kind of like evolved to a new place. I don't know that that might be something to to play with. Um, also, also I think that uh, you could explore the resonance of the bell more as a as an effect. I don't know if in C sound you're able to play with. Um, like increasing reverb or like delay time or I have it in my second part. Yeah. We okay. Have... So you get into that. Okay. Great. At first, I decided to just use uh, reverb and uh, to to have a uh, my in in use in my development, but. Uh, Really, it uh, still didn't give me uh, some effective sound to make a, a really difference between part A and B, and because of that, I used to uh, the covers and the stress to have new sounds there. What else do you play with in the development? Uh, beyond, I'm thinking also just the the attack of the bell. You could you could stretch out the actual attack and and make it softer. Or, um... I discovered, I, uh, I replayed the music from the into part, mm -hmm. and it is uh, uh, a very, very different sound. Yeah. And uh, so by, by the uh, nuance and by the volume that I use, it makes a lot of difference in my music. Mm -hmm. This part, mm -hmm. and from this part. Yeah. Um, and I told you that this first one, the P1, this process, it, it makes the sound from the uh, normal sound to this like sound. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, um, yeah, there's a lot of different um, dimensions to the bell sound that you can kind of play with in I often think in terms of parameters, so just like, you know, loudness or uh, duration uh, or rhythmic intensity, anything you can kind of like plot on a graph. And I often think about like a state of change from like one, one extreme to another extreme, which you kind of did in, in the A section where it's, it started slow and it got a lot faster. Um, so yeah, I think it's really cool the way you're breaking down the bell sample into a bunch of different parameters and experimenting with them individually. Um, I think there's, do you ever listen to music like, um, do you know the composer Alvin Lussier? Have you ever heard of him? No. You might like his music. Uh, it's, the last name is L-U-C-I-E-R. Here, I'll put it in the chat. And there's a bunch of his stuff. Oh, Nassim did it. Uh, she beat me to it. Um, he has a bunch of cool pieces that involve like, putting microphones inside bells and re recording the resonance. Um, and he does a lot with just like the resonant sound. So you might, you might listen to some of his music for inspiration, but I think we're probably, we probably need to move on. Right. But, uh, yeah. But thank you for showing this to me, uh, payment. It's really, it's really great. So keep at it. Yeah. It's a really good conversation. Like, <laughs> we can explore a lot of things. Yeah, okay. there's a lot. Okay, um, should we move on to... About the notation. Uh, is it a clear notation? Or... I think that um, 
well, so this isn't something that human that like people would perform from, right? It's it's like to help us follow the recording. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I think I think it for that purpose, it's very clear. It's very clear. Um, the timestamps is really helpful. The way everything is lined up, it's very kind of like systematic and structured and really good. Um, yeah, if for for individual performers, they might not be able to follow the rhythms precisely, but but it's an electronic piece. So yeah, I think it's cool. Um, you might. I don't know, you might experiment with using different colors for the, because you've got all these different arcs down at the bottom for different things, like volume and the agogic accent and the processes you're using. You can put those in different colors to, to make it, I don't know, just a little more eye-catching and kind of break up the, the black and white page. Because um, there's no reason, you, you know, you're not required to do black and white. Um, but no, I, I, I've done, I often use the, the box technique that you're doing with, where you put a rhythm in a box and then you have the, the continue on line. That, I think that's a great notation. I, I do that all the time. So yeah, it's very good. Nice. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, Hamed, if you're ready to share or uh, you want me to share, I don't know how yes. you prefer. <clears throat> Hello, my friends, especially dear Peter. Hi. Um, I'm very happy to meet you here and welcome to our class. My piece uh, is written for a bookshelf containing 11 books. Uh, that 10 number of them are inside the shelf in front of the performer. Uh, one of the books is open, it, is placed uh, next to the um, performer right hand. Um, and uh, there is also a fan and uh, a newspaper hanging in front of the fan next to the play, uh, player's left hand. Um, in addition, the uh, performer's whispering voice is used uh, with almost certain rhythms and undetermined pitches. Um, I have um, considering this bookshelf as a percussion instrument, and I have used different symbols to play different sounds on it. And that I explained to you. Although my piece isn't complete yet, uh, let me share my score for you. Hamed, you, you, you explained it very well. I can imagine the setting very, very well, the way you described Thank it, you the bookshelf much. and the newspaper. Yeah. Yeah. So the idea about this is that um, we, were, we didn't even have any performers in our class. So the students had to write for each other. So Payman was kind of exceptional case that he decided to go for electroacoustic. And I really didn't want to like force the students to any specific direction. I left them open in the idea, but material had to be something practical. So Hamed is writing for another um, member. So they discussed, so the, then he chose the bookshelf. So then the other person also have access to that. No, I think that's really great. And I, I mean, again, it's the, this idea of like having a limitation, giving you an opportunity to explore something in a way that you might not have otherwise. So, and, and I, I mean, I, I love music that uses every day. Sorry, there's a plane flying overhead. I don't know if you can hear the, can you hear the plane? Yeah. Speaking of everyday noise, um, I think it's great to um, write pieces for things like bookshelves and also combining traditional instruments with uh, uh, with non-traditional instruments. I, I did a piece a long time ago when I was an undergraduate, uh, several years ago at this point, where I, I play trombone and I played a duet with a lawnmower, which I thought was just because <laughs> like because lawnmowers, you know, that they, they, they just have a nice like grumbling like motor sound and I can make kind of like rumbly sounds on my trombone. And I just think Things like that. So, like a book, like a, a bookshelf piece is terrific, and it could even be expanded into like, like a duet for like I don't know, flute and bookshelf. If you get ever find a flutist or something, so 
I just think it's a great idea to use non-traditional instruments. Thank you. Um, here are uh, some symbols. Uh, the first one uh, is for beating the bookshelf with a book. Another uh, for tap on the book cover with nails, uh, one nail or two nails or more. Um, rub palm of the hand over the book covers. Shake a book on its place. Rub fingernails over book covers. The number of fingers uh, show at the first up sign in the piece. Uh, turn on the fan. Um, we have three modes on fan. Slow mode, medium, and fast. And fan off means uh, fan is off. Um, hypothetical line for better timeline reading. Uh, moments emphasized by vertical dashed lines have to be exactly together. Uh, flip the book page, the number above, uh, above the sign shows the order number of the book uh, papers. And the size of the sign compared with timeline shows the speed of the page turning to the performer. Uh, and the last sign on measure taps on the books covered with all fingers names. Um, in this sign color concentration uh, that I show in the next page, um, show the mass of taps. Uh, the red color is for right hand and the black color is for the left hand. That's terrific. I, I just want to say you um, you came up with a lot of great sounds with just a book and books and bookshelves, and also your your symbol notation choices are very good in that they, um, I feel like they really represent the sound very well in a very intuitive way. The the, the shapes and and symbols that you chose to use, um, so it, I think it will be actually pretty intuitive for the performer to to read from the score, so. Good job with the notation. Thank you. Did you design all the, did you draw some of those um, yourself or did you, or did you use them? I know some of yes, them are yes, like in Photoshop, I in Photoshop. Good. Excellent. Oh, thank you. Yes. Um, on the first page of the score, we have um, three lines. Uh, the bottom lines here is for books one, to five. Uh, the middle line is a timeline, uh, which is based on seconds. And the top line is uh, for book number six to 10, which is played by the right hand. Um, and book uh, one to five played by the left hand. Uh, sign on this page include dynamics, sign and predefined signs, such as shaking a book uh, here, um, beating the shelf floor here and here. Uh, page two is um, like the first page here, isn't new things. Um, in page three, uh, we have uh, turning signs here uh, that uh, I show the dynamic of turning page. Um, and the number of uh, pages that uh, we should turn it. Um, here also is whispering of the performer, uh, which an almost certain reason, but uh, she can choose and use uh, what pitches that she likes. Um, and the poem, uh, the lyric um, is uh, for a great Iranian uh, the page uh, four uh, shows the direction of movement of the palm of the right hand here, the palm of the hand um, on the mark lines and also the bottom line show the movement for uh, the nails of the left hand. Um, page five is like 
previous page. And the last page, um, sixth page, uh, for a better performer's understanding, the two hands are placed uh, next to each other. Uh, and we have 10 lines, lines here. Um, in this graphical way, the color, uh, the color concentration is considered as an approximately increase um, in the number of nails beat uh, two box cover not dynamics. Um, for example, here uh, we have a lot of beats um, and it is forte, but here we have a lot of beats, uh, but it is piano. Um, I mean, yeah, it is. No, it's really excellent. Your notation, I think, is, is very uh, clear and, and it's creative in, in like you're totally inventing techniques to get certain sounds uh, and you've invented notation to convey those techniques. But I think the way you've laid it out on the page is very like easy to read and understand. So good job with the notation. Have you, uh, is this for a single performer or is it for, for two, just one um, person? No, I uh, did it, uh, but it, uh, it is my first graphical notation. Okay. So I wrote what I just showed them, I think I can. Barry, yik, now was on the university. Yes, yes, this is for one performer. For one, okay, right, cool. Um, do, have you, uh, who's gonna be the performer? Is it you or is it someone else? Shabnam is the performer, but uh, he isn't online. Okay. H has he practiced it already? Is he able to do the, the, the two-handed? Does it ever get too complex for him? Yes, uh, okay. but she. Uh, he's she. a woman. Uh, ah, she. Uh, she uh, we uh, are practicing with each other and, and continuing writing the piece. Okay. That's good. Um, yeah, working. Um, that's great that, that you're working kind of together with your performer. Because um, sometimes when we come up with these kinds of sounds, they don't always sound exactly like we imagine them that they will. So it's good to actually experiment and make sure it's actually something that can like be physically done and there's enough time, especially with like with I noticed like one of the techniques is you take the book, I guess, off the shelf and you actually turn some pages. So that's going to take some time, like before and after, to, to get the book and put it back. So just thinking about things like that, like how's it actually going to physically work? It's good that you're experimenting uh, as you write. Um, I guess I have, I have a similar question to what I asked Payman, which is how, how do you think about the form of this piece? How did you decide what was going to happen when? Actually, the form is free, uh, okay. but we can uh, dividing the uh, piece to uh, line section. Um, that they are before the silence and after the silence. Uh, we have a line silence. Um, if uh, the silence um, was a uh, um, um, separate section. Separate section. We have three uh, sections in it. I also have a question. Why do you have this like 30 second of silence in the middle of this? Like This is almost a short piece. And does it have any like theatrical element to it? Uh, in, in libraries, the um, silence is an important thing. Uh, the piece, what to want this. So my, you might think of the performance to like sit on a chair, like pretending to be in a library, maybe, to yes, like yes, theatrically yes. present it for the audience as well. Yes, yes, yes. 
that's that's a really great idea. I think yeah, I think um, I would agree very much with with Nassim that a piece like this, you, you really have to embrace the theatrical element of it, because I think already, you know, the idea of having a piece of music for a bookshelf uh, is totally something that we can do, but it's it's going to appear uh, out of the ordinary, right? Like automatically, people just it's not the it's not the expectation. Um, so since there's already that surprise and that that difference about it, it can be something that you really embrace and make it super theatrical to show that you're like really um, being very intentional about that aspect of the piece. So yeah, I think yeah that long silence could be. It, yeah, I mean, it, think about what you'd want the performer to do during that silence. Maybe they would actually just sit there and quietly actually just read a book for that thirty seconds, or maybe I, I don't. Or maybe they would just sit perfectly still um, and be like silent with their body as well. But yeah, think about like Nassim said, the theatrical. Yes. Um, I think one thing is like with the rhythms you have, you've notated rhythms for the speaking, but it's not it's not totally clear how those like what tempo that would be or how those rhythms relate to the timeline you have. Um, so I, I wonder if it's even worth using specific rhythms or if you just could have like even just like long and short and not even like worry like do, do you want it to be really precise and metrical i mean you've got like 16th notes and half notes do you, do you want them to count it and be very precise or does it not really matter um, you need to answer <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, the uh, rhythms um, are not say a certain rhythm like a uh, whole note or half note uh, but uh, it uh, helps the performer to imagine uh, that uh, what long is a, yeah. Um, yeah. a word. Yeah. Yeah, you don't have to change it. it. It certainly works, but you might consider, I think with notation, one thing I think about is making sure that I'm conveying exactly the level of detail that I want to convey, but not any more. Like, so if, if it's really just about kind of like a, a more natural speaking pattern with long and short, you might just use, you might just use like an open note head and a closed note head with no, with no stems and you just have long and short and you could just give instructions to the performers and say, you know, make it a natural speech pattern and just have long and short syllables. And that might be easier for them because then they're not trying to count specific rhythms if you don't really need those specific rhythms um but you don't i mean you don't have to change it the way you've done it now basically conveys that too um i think yeah there's definitely um i think there's a similar thing i think nasim's point about the theatricality will be really important as you like f finish this piece um it's the same kind of thing of my comment to Payman of like, I don't know if this will make sense, but this is kind of what I'm thinking right now. Sometimes with a piece of music, especially with contemporary music, you know, with experimental music, whatever we want to call it, we, with every piece, we kind of define the limits of that particular piece, you know, with, like, we define it anew, right? It's not like we're just like, it's not like we're just writing a piano sonata or something where everything is defined for us. You, with this piece, you've defined a set of kind of elements. And sorry, there's a plane happening again, but um, we've got all the sounds that you introduce us to with the, you know, the, the books on the shelves and the flipping of the pages, and then the whispering comes in. So that's a really nice moment where uh, the spoken language kind of transcends the limits that you've already defined. You know what I mean? You've defined kind of a space where there's like book sounds. And then at a certain point, they become vocal sounds and they kind of step outside of that space. You know what I mean? Like they go further. Um, and then the big long moment of silence is another moment where it kind of transcends the boundaries that have been established. Um, I wonder, it's the same question that I had for payment. Do you want it to kind of like establish itself and grow and then kind of return to where it came from? Or do you want it to grow into something brand new? 
does that make sense? Where it's like we end in a place where we didn't begin. Um, like, I don't know, maybe at, at, maybe at, at the end, the, the performer like rips up a book or something, or at the end, the performer actually just sits down and like reads the book or like reads it out loud. Or um, I don't know, maybe the performer leaves the room or maybe a, a librarian comes in and tells the performer to be quiet and like kicks them out or something. You know, you know what I mean? Like something that happens at the end that is like beyond anything we came from in some way. Do you know what I mean? Uh, it just might be worth thinking about. There's a lot of different ways you could kind of experiment with that. But th yeah, with these kinds of pieces, I think you really have to, you have to think about like kind of the expectations you're establishing and then how you're uh, surprising or like you're moving beyond those expectations or confirming them. You always want to think like, am I confirming an expectation or am I like doing something surprising? Because that's when you're using like totally invented sounds and techniques, that's all we have. That's all we have. It's like establishing an expectation and then violating that expectation. Uh, and you have to do it all yourself because there's no, the audience isn't going to be able to come into this piece with any like standard expectations because there's not like a whole like genre of bookshelf pieces. Right. Um, so you have to be really intentional about how you like construct that for yourself. But, but I think you've done that with, a, I think the form of this piece is very like, has a lot of these moments where it like very clearly kind of evolves. Um, so, so it's great. Good job. Thank you very much. Yeah. Cool. I hadn't seen this, like this version of the score. It was a like, kind of surprise for me as well. Didn't send me. <laughs> okay, we should move on to Milad. And um, his piece is gonna have a like huge discussion because his piece has a lot, ton of elements of theatrical points in it. Excellent. That's it. Can you help me <laughs> for translate? Yeah, I will help you. Thank you. Okay, you want to share your screen? Uh, can you share my... Or you uh, have it already on the sketches. Yes. Okay. Number six. Oh. oh, that's good. Yeah, this is way better if you upload your works on the sketches, please. You know, they have done a lot of stuff during this uh, course and they just removed it from sketches so no one can see what is really happening. It's good to share our process with each other and, and talk about it as we... I'm a, as a composer, sometimes in the past, I've gotten in the habit of really obsessing over like a piece that I'm writing and kind of like doing it all by myself and it taking a long time. And it always surprises me once you actually like show it to another person to get their feedback or sh especially show it to a performer and actually ask them to do it. It really changes. Uh, it gives you a lot of information. So I've, I've made the mistake in the past of like kind of being too much in my own head about it. So I think it's great that Nassim is having you guys like share sketches with each other and talk about the process. I think that's really important. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, Mila, you, you want me to explain or you are you ready to explain uh, what you do? Can you explain for me? Okay, yeah. so, okay, so I will explain. So he's uh, writing for kitchen sounds based on like the how emotions can impact the quality of sounds like when his mom is like angry or he's she's happy or the quality of sounds changes. And uh, he's come up with this set of um, actions and uh, um, and so I was just show you the general shape of it and then he has this like precise rhythmic um, gestures and Ava is gonna present the like perform the piece. 
So this is the only moment he has a melody for a, like a soprano or of just the voice maybe. Uh, I'm not sure if he like. خیلی مطمئن نیستم که دقیقا واسه سوپرانو میخوای یا فقط هر چی پویس صدا باشه نه پرفورمری که بتونه بخونه اگه آقا هم باشه میتونه همین ملودی رو یا اکتاب بمتر بخونه مشکلی نداره یا مثلا اوکی سو دست بس پویس مبی بین ان اکتیف دیسپلیسمنت اوکی سو آی ویل لیو ایت تو یو گایز Can, can we go back to the um, all the, the instructions part of the score with all the different so what what are all the different elements there's a can of beans which you shake uh, 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 taking off the lid okay pouring the beans that's funny okay back and forth okay is it pretty much all with a can of beans? Um, فقط از تو یه قوطی لوبیا داری استفاده می‌کنی. Yes, yes. قوطی mm-hmm. لوبیا and a table. And a table. And your uh Nasim said you were you're thinking about emotions, which I think is is really a good place to start. Um what different emotions are you trying to use for this piece? Mm. راجب حرکت ها چی؟ درباره چه چه مدل احساساتی تو میخواد توی قیطت نشون بدی؟ نوشتم عصبانیت ناراحتی I, can I ask what, what is it about um, what's the connection between being in the kitchen and cooking and anger and sadness because that might be I because those are kind of those are like negative emotions but I wonder what's the association what was as opposed to like happy emotions or um, even just like desire or hunger or something اگه درست متوجه شده باشم این ربط این احساسات به حرکت ها بود درسته so he is um, so it it has a um, in direction association with the kitchen sounds that like when you're angry inside this it shows up in the quality of sounds Certainly, certainly. I think um, thinking about like emotion or affect um, and the quality of the sound is a great way to think about music and organize sounds for a piece. Um, I wonder if you could expand the range of emotions that you could try to deal with with this piece uh, beyond anger and sadness. Um, but maybe that maybe that's not necessary but it, it would at least be worth thinking about like why thinking about why why you're limiting it to that that range of those two um it doesn't have to be different but it can be good to think about what you know the reason for making that choice um how how long is the piece five minutes five minutes okay And it's also it's a solo performer, single performer. Yes. Yes. Okay. Can you, uh, Nasim, would you mind just kind of scrolling through the score, and I'll just kind of glance. So, so singing, singing while drumming can be a little bit of a challenge. Is your performer have they practiced that? Yes, she she practiced. She can do it. Okay. And where did you get the, so what is the, the melody is very nice. Um, I was kind of humming it to myself. Is that a fragment? Is that something you wrote or is it a quote of something or is it based on anything? Uh, it's, it's mine. 
It's yours? No, it's very good. Yeah. It has a it has a nice shape to it, the way it rises up to the the D and, and it comes back down. Um, it's very nice. The right. the the augmented second, the F sharp to E flat near the end is also it's it's a it's a nice melody the way it kind of unfolds. Um and it yeah, I just say poof. <laughs> Yeah, no, it's it's really neat. Um, does is there just does the does the humming happen only once or was it twice? Um, فقط یک بار توی قطعه داره هم میکنه. یعنی یه ملودی داره میخونه یا انجام تو یه هم دیگه داری درسته؟ دو بار ملود. It's so yeah, so it's twice. It's twice. Yeah. Yeah, so it has a, so it returns. That's a that that can be a very dramatic. I mean, it always is a very dramatic effect. No matter what it is, if something happens once and then other things happen for a while and then that thing comes back, it'll be it, that'll be like a really impactful moment. So you may want to think about how you're handling that return. Um, I see the the melody is exactly the same when it comes back. You might want to make it a little longer. You might, I think there's a lot of uh, material there that could be expanded if you wanted to have the return be a little more developed. Um, or, or if you want it to be exactly the same, I think that has a very specific effect too. Um, but certainly you could like, if, if you wanted to expand it, you could make the individual phrases longer and have a wider range. Um, it go a little higher, go a little lower. Uh, definitely playing around with that augmented second between the F sharp and the E flat, maybe a D below it. That that's a really cool collection of pitches. Um, so that that little that little segment of the melody could definitely like grow into into something bigger. Um, tell me how how do you think about the the flow of the other sounds in the piece like is it is it depicting a literal like cooking situation or is it more abstract the uh, flow means um maybe said the hoi dge ke tui qit adari khayli barkhordat ba ina intezaye ya in ke waqa'an ye sedaye ke tui ashpas khune dar mazan normal etefaq miyofte bardash Uh, توی ایران این نرمال اتفاق میفته توی حالت متفاوت نرمال این ایران So yeah, I, you, you might want to think about if, you're, if you want your performer to wear a costume like is, if, if, you're, if you're invoking like, like an actual real life situation like being in the kitchen and being like angry um, maybe like the, a costume needs to be a part of that because it's not just some it's not just some abstract piece of music it's like representing a real part of real life um so yeah i think it's it's definitely about embracing the theatricality as we've been talking about um i think you've got so much material in this piece i imagine it could be i would have to i, I would be curious to hear it in its entirety I, i i wonder if some of if it could be expanded because you have so much it, it looks like it just looking at the score it looks like it kind of changes pretty quickly like something happens and something different happens and something different happens um i'd be interested to to hear it and i'd, I'd be curious to think to to see if i feel like it it feels short it, like i or if if it feels like it could go longer um But other than that, I, I, I think it's great. I look forward to hearing it. I think the, um, well, here's one final thought, actually. At the very, near the beginning, at, at measure six, you've got the performer both humming and doing a percussive rhythm. Is that the only part where there's like synchrony between those two things? It looks like it, right? Uh. 
متوجه نشد میگه که so are you asking for دیگه for like not to be together you mean or the it looks like in measure 6 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 mm -hmm. that those are synchronized in, in rhythm right but it doesn't ha but it's not like that later in the piece later in the piece when the performer mm -hmm. hums it's just humming by itself right the, the reason I'm asking is that it can it, it seems like it's pretty dramatic to have those to have that rhythmic synchrony where there's like percussion and singing happening simultaneously it'll feel very like it'll feel very cohesive and like kind of structured in that in that moment um, whereas some of the other stuff looks like it'll feel a little more free floating just kind of events happening kind of in space um, so you so need I, to be more organic toward the like structure of that yeah you know? I, I wonder if the synchronized part should maybe come closer to the end because it, it'll feel like a big kind of dramatic like a culmination of things it might you might give away to you might have powerful material a little too early in the piece that you kind of give away the the surprise of it might when when the singing comes back at the end without the percussion mm -hmm. it might feel a little anticlimactic like we've already kind of heard i'm not sure uh it might seem like we've already kind of heard that but we've already heard it in a more complex way and now it's a little simpler um Or maybe it'll have a nice effect of like, kind of like standing outside of time and being this like little moment of repose. I'm not sure. Um, but yeah, I'm just kind of thinking, I'm just thinking different thoughts about how, how to structure the form of all this material. And, and like, if you, if you want there to be, well, I guess, yeah, my last question I would ask is like, do you want there to be kind of like a narrative arc? Like, is there, like, is there a story being told? with a beginning, middle, and end, and like drama that escalates, or is it just kind of like, is it a more of a flat form where just different things can happen at different times? Does that, does that difference make sense? Maybe Nassim, you could, could explain. I don't know if I'm going to ask you a question. What are you going to ask me? What are you going to ببین الان بحث اینه که تو این فرمی که طراحی کردی قرار فرمی باشه که یه روند مثل داستان داشته باشه که میخوای یه دیرکشنی بری یا اینکه فرم خاصی نداره و هر چیزی هر زمانی میتونه اتفاق بیفته بحث اینه که تو الان یه چیزی که خیلی دقیق دو بار تکرار کردی این ملودی که دقیقا دوباره این همون اول میاد سوال اینه که این چرا هیچ توش تغییری نداره دلیل چیه که بعد و یکی این که این ملودی که الان اینجا آوردی خیلی فرم ساده تری داره با چیزی که به نسبت تو اون اول آوردی به حال از دیدگاه اودینس بخوابش نگاه کنی این یه خورده چیزی میشه که خب ما چرا یه چیزی رو کامپلکس تر اول شنیدیم بعد حالا به شکل ساده تر داره دوباره برمیگرده یعنی این برای شنونده این سوال رو ایجاد میکنه که چرا این اتفاق افتاده حالا چراشو تو بعد توضیح بدی اینکه شاید هم میخوای تغییرش بدی بعدا حالا دوباره که تو بخوایی اولش میگم خب این یه چیزی بین این بین داستان و اینکه هر چیزی میتونه اتفاق بیفته است خب یعنی یه داستانی داره ولی تو این داستانه هر چیزی ممکنه هر لحظه پیش بیاد یه همچین حالتی که بتونم درست منظورم بگم و اینکه اون ملودی دفعه اول ساده ساده خونده میشه خیلی پیچیده نیست یعنی اون ریتم خیلی آزاده خب نه تو چیز داری دیگه تو کنارش این چیز پرکاشن هم داری It's not just singing It's singing with percussion at the beginning <laughs> So let me translate what you said um, So you, you want to have a sort of a story that can be also unpredictable You know I, I have a comment at this point that if you want to like emphasize on unpredictability 
one way to do it might be just to break down the melody like you have the full melody at the beginning and like we are like hearing sections of a melody or maybe like a melody like in replacement like the end of the melody in the beginning and like break down the melody throughout the piece so it will be more unexpected I think that's such a great piece of advice. And it, I think the melody you've written lends itself to that because it's already in fragments. There, there's a single slurred phrase with a fermata at the end and it's multiple. So you could literally just like take those fragments and rearrange them uh, or multiply them or modify them um, in a lot of different ways. But if you, if you have any reason, like if this is your piece, you know, but you're just asking. So because already it's a question that why, why this melody is returning back like this way. So if you can explain, but it's, it's just دفعه اولی که اجرا میشه خیلی آرومه و هیچ اتفاقی هنوز نیفتاده هیچ چیزی ذهنش رو درگیر نکرده و خوشحاله و خودش داره یه ملودی رو زمزمه میکنه مثلا چیز سختی نیست بعد اون بعد از یه سری اتفاقات که میفته عصبانی میشه ناراحت میشه و هر چی اتفاقی که براش میفته تو این داستانه اونجا برمیگردیم به اون آهنگ و دوباره اونو خونده میشه ولی این دفعه حسش فرق میکنه یعنی okay. So what you want is a change in expression, but we don't see that changes in expression in the notation. So you might want to like work on the notation and really put that gestures there, like the dynamics then should change. Maybe the tempo should change and like you might need to like, if it is going to be in an angry mood, maybe you need to like work on accents and staccato, like kind of that kind of gesture. But what we have here as now is like exactly the same thing. We just have removed the percussion or maybe you want to put this at the beginning and then put it back with the percussion as a second time that it's coming back. It's, it's your piece, but you also need to like be, um, you know, kind of logical in the format you in the structure that you are defining your set you know and yeah absolutely and exaggerate if you want a certain effect to come across you really have to communicate it very very clearly to the performer and they have to really exaggerate it for it to actually uh get that result to the audience um so yeah i i think that's probably where i would leave the the feedback of like think about how you want this return of this melody to, to what's the effect you want to produce with the audience? What, what's the specific emotion or like change you want to suggest from when we heard it the first time and when it comes back the second time? That return is going to be so dramatic. So think about what kind of return you want it to be. Is there a change of mood? Um, and if there is a change of mood, how are you going to get the performer to convey that? How are you going to use notation to convey that to the performer? I think you could do a little more on that. But the, but the material you have for this piece is really creative and good. You're exploring a lot of different possibilities with just a single like can of beans and like the human voice. And, that's re and you, have, you have a really creative theatrical setting with some ideas about affect and emotion. So it's a lot of, uh, a lot of really good material that, is, um, that looks like it'll make a, a really interesting piece. I would just continue to nuance the vocal part, I think in particular, because that's going to be, I think, that's going to be the thing that I think the audience will probably remember the most, the melody that they're hearing and the human voice. So I think that'll be the most dramatic part of the piece. So give that even more thought about how you want it to come across, I think. But really good, yeah. I also have this um, kind of same comment. You have this again, five second silence why first of all start thinking about that why do you have this silence there 
and what is happening. So specifically that your like the theatrical element is really high in your piece. You probably need to mention like a director, like a like a um, script writer that what would be the situation of your performer in this single like five seconds. Five seconds in music is a lot. So mm -hmm. yeah, if it's standing, how, how can, not moving. Uh, how can I explain this uh, in a structure or in the part two? Um, you can write it down as a text, like inside the, in the inside the measure. You can maybe even like remove the staff lines in that measure and just put a text, a block, a box of text there, and on top of it, like five seconds, that action. Or if the action is really complicated, you can put a link to a video, right there. Or any way that you think will be easier and clear for the performer. Okay, thank you. Welcome. Awesome. Great. Well, thank really you. cool, really cool pieces, everybody. I think this is it's it's awesome. Wait. I, I mean, in one sense, it's kind of a limitation to not have access to, you know, performers on traditional instruments, but the, it, it motivates you to be very creative. And I think um, the pieces you guys are creating are like, I, they, they would be really interesting to create, even if you did have access to performers. Like it, it, the choices y'all are making for the sounds you're using and the theatrical elements and the way you're kind of expanding our conception of what a piece of music can be and how it can function, I think are not just, um, they're not just like compromises you're making due to your limitations. They're actually like really good creative musical choices in themselves. Um, so definitely continue to explore this, uh, this realm of music making. I, I mean, for me, I, uh, and we'll get into it in the second hour, some of the stuff I do, um, I like playing, um, as a performer, I like playing like little like toy instruments, like like baby toys and things like that, um, and different sound makers. Um, just because I think you know the world is so full of, the world is full of sound, right? And I think we uh, one really great thing that we can do with what we do with making contemporary music is showing people new ways of listening to the world that they're already in in their everyday lives um definitely that's that's kind of part of my experience as um just on a daily basis i wake up in the morning and i'm i'm kind of tuned in to the um the sounds that i'm just the soundscape of, of my house you know uh even just little things like the um the fan in the bathroom or the noise the hum of the refrigerator or you know the birds that are outside or the traffic noise every every location has a really unique really rich soundscape um and because i've spent you know so much of my my life like working on you know music and coming up with creative sounds and combining them and uh, that's like made me very tuned in to just like my everyday life the sonic parts of my everyday life and i i mean that just makes life better it makes it more interesting it makes it more fun you can you can sit for 20 minutes and just enjoy the the sound of you know the, the natural sounds of wherever you are. Um, so I think it's just, you know, the pieces y'all are making are really important, really interesting, very cool. Um, and I think Nassim's doing a great job helping you guys kind of shape them into something. So I'm looking forward to the final concert. I think it's going to be really cool. Thank you. Yes. Awesome. So. So I have. You. Yeah, what, what do you want to do next, Nassim? I have different things I can show you all. It's just your time. Do whatever you want to do. Okay. <laughs> Great. Well, um, I, so I'll play a little bit for you all. I have my trombone here in my, in my little apartment. There it is. And, um, but it's, it is, it's sort of early in the morning here where I am, and I have, I have neighbors, so I don't want to be too loud for them. But I do have, I have a bunch of recordings and videos and stuff that I can play for you to just see different 
different trombone techniques and maybe just give you some some musical ideas as well um so why don't i i'll play something for you we can talk about it we can just see see what we get through if you have any questions we can just open it up um so the first thing i'll play is uh so our trumpet professor here at uc san diego her name is stephanie richards and she's this really amazing trumpet improviser and she put together a ensemble uh, a few months ago to, to play a show as part of a festival that she was doing and i i felt very lucky to get included in the band and it's a really it's a really great band with it's me and another trombonist and stephanie playing trumpet and uh another professor named Amy playing viola and a, a friend of ours, uh, Paul playing saxophone. And there's a couple double basses and a drummer and guitar and keyboard. So it's kind of a, kind of a jazz setting, kind of a free jazz, uh, ensemble, but I just want to, um, play the, there was uh, the, the one other thing is that it's a style called conduction. So there was this, um, trumpet player and band leader named Butch Morris. I'll put his name in the chat. Um, Butch Morris. And he invented this uh, style of directed improvisation called conduction. Uh, it's kind of like conducting. But um, you can look it up on, online. Uh, there, basically, conduction has a lot of different like hand symbols and cues that the conductor can give to an ensemble of improvisers. So there's no score. Uh, we, none of us were looking at any, any notation at all, and we hadn't rehearsed or planned anything in advance. But we were all just familiar enough with this style of directed hand signals called conduction. So Stephanie is going to be kind of leading the ensemble, and we're going to be improvising based on the cues that she gives us. So um, it was a really fun gig, and we, kind of, we played for, uh, I think, probably like 40 minutes or something. I won't play the whole thing. I'll play a little section. But there was one spot where she kind of gave me a chance to take a solo, so I wanted to play that for y'all. Um, I think she set up a really beautiful texture with, um, it's almost like twinkling stars. There's like beautiful kind of like points of different pitches that are really beautiful. And then she cues me to take a solo. So she's kind of set up a, like a background texture and then invites me to take a solo on top of that. And I'll be playing with my Harmon mute, so it's the, it's the big... Uh, silver mute with the kind of wah-wah on the front. Uh, Miles Davis uses a Harmon mute a lot in a lot of his classic recordings and makes the brass sound really kind of bright and tinny, but really resonant. And it's just a really kind of piercing, beautiful sound. And I like to play with the Harmon mute, especially the wah-wah, the wah-wah-wah-wah-wah-wah-wah. Uh, combined with my trombone slide, uh, you'll just see I do kind of silly effects with it. So here we go. I will share my screen and play a little bit of this for y'all. And I can share the audio too.
So I'll, I'll stop it right there. But it, it goes on and on. Um, I think that, yeah, th thank you. For, uh, I think there's something like really hilarious. You, you can see the other trombonist, Michael Dessen, the, the guy sitting next to me, just starts laughing at a certain point. Uh, I, when Jonathan, the, the vocalist, comes in on the microphone and he's just, ah! and it's just like, it just has this kind of like ludicrous, again, theatrical quality, but um, in a really great way. I think it's okay for music to be funny, actually, sometimes. I think sometimes like contemporary music is very like serious, right? But if, if we're going to do things like um, have a piece of music for like a can of beans, it it might as well like be fun, right? It might as well be a funny kind of humorous thing. Um, so yeah, uh, y'all could kind of hear uh, the way the saxophone and the viola at the beginning were giving some pitches and I was trying to imitate them. I don't know if you, I was sort of matching pitch a little bit, but doing a lot of effects where um, the trombone and, and brass instruments in general, I, they're really fun for me how much just kind of like chaos you can make um, when you just like we call it we call it ripping uh, uh, French horns usually they call it like a horn rip where they just like where they kind of just like rip up um, and with trombone especially both me and Michael you could hear us do just kind of just going nuts with our slides and just like kind of ripping all over the place um, like Michael came in and really high and we're just going you can just really go crazy <laughs> on a trombone um and if you yeah if you want to use those kinds of like the, the squiggly line or just text instructions just be like you can sometimes give contours um where we can like follow it up and down like if you if you gave me like a squiggly line that went up and down i could do you know <laughs> just just wacky sounds um so that's always a, a fun thing to do and then i don't actually i'm sorry i don't have my mute with me here today but you saw in the video uh the Harmon mute lets me do the the wah wah and i sometimes um i can combine that with the slide to even get even more degrees of kind of just like chaos and it, it almost has like a speaking quality, like like a person like you know, like like someone's mouth. Um, so that you know, the tr the trombone, I think for me, because it can slide and it can do like the wah wah. It just it has a very vocal quality to it. Sometimes you can imitate kind of uh, human speech a little bit. Um, so yeah, does it, I have more to play for y'all, but does anyone have any questions or comments about that right now? Either what we listened to or what I said? What I want to say is that it's also really impressive that the brass instruments can be also really soft, even softer mm -hmm. than flute. Yes, yeah, especially with mutes. Uh, and using mutes with brass is really recommended. Um, they all they give the instruments different tone qualities and can help us play really soft. Uh, cup mute is always really beautiful. Harmon Harmon mute lets us do the wah wah. Um, we use plungers. We have straight mutes. A lot of stuff is on YouTube too. If if you search on YouTube for just brass mutes, you can find people doing demonstrations of all the different sounds. So definitely always yeah think about using mutes with brass. And um. One thing I also do, I'll just show you and then I'll, I'll play something for you that, that uses it. Um, because I like, to, I, I like to use what we call extended techniques, where we're playing the instrument kind of beyond the way it was originally designed to play. Uh, and one really thing I really love doing is taking my mouthpiece out and just playing uh, without a mouthpiece. And it just lets me make... Uh, I can't really make notes this way, but it lets me make really cool kind of white noise at, that I can kind of control a little bit. And it, it just sounds like this.
it just it's kind of like screeching tires or something but any brass instrument can do that if they take their mouthpiece out it's just kind of the way that the horns work um so yeah with all these things you know you want to you want to work with your performer and make sure they're comfortable and able to do whatever you want them to do but um but definitely brass extended techniques are a really fun thing to explore the no mouthpiece different mutes uh can be really fun but let me um Unless there's anything else, any other thoughts or questions, I'll play more music for you. Yeah, there was a like bass tone in that, all that noise. It was like a kind of separate line. It's, this is really cool sound. I think it was one of the, because there's Mark Dresser and Catherine playing bass. And I think one of them, I think it was Mark. No, yeah. no, no, just just the noise you... Uh, oh, you just play. me, oh. Yeah, oh. it's... it's it has a like it, uh, it. It's kind of single individual like bass tone, and then on top of that noise. Yeah. No. Some absolutely. Sometimes with the noisy stuff, you get it becomes very rich, and there's different tones you can hear in it. I'll try to isolate. <laughs> Yeah, is is that yeah, there's all these different sounds. And I, I can't uh, I can't really control it, but it's sort of partial control, which I think is really interesting. What is uh, the difference between them? These two sound in playing. Which between which two sounds? This the, one and uh, the one before it. Okay. The what? Yeah. Well, I'm just I'm just making small changes with my lips and kind of experimenting. I don't actually always know what's going to happen with with the no mouthpiece technique. It's not it's not something like you can really control it. I think um, the most I can control it is kind of trying to make it higher or lower. But when I go higher, or when I go lower, it's always going to be something unexpected that happens. Um, so I can just tighten my lips or loosen my lips to go up and down. Uh, uh, uh... A certain name that you wrote for the performance. Um, I would just say one. I would just say no mouthpiece or white noise. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And yes. I, Thank you. yeah, and notation. It could just be like a thick, like a like a bar or or a squiggly, just some kind of like noisy looking notation that isn't a pitch, like a squiggly squiggly line or something like that. Um, and I can control kind of the loudness of it too. I so some of you guys do the, like the the different graphs to control different parameters. You could have a graph for like loudness, and one for like pitch up and down, and I could kind of follow those graphs with the the white noise sound. Yeah. I'll um I'll play something for you with more with the no mouthpiece stuff, but in a in a context with other performers. Um, let's see. So, Is it something that you can also do it with circular breathing? If, um, if I were able to do circular breathing, then yes. But I'm actually not able to do that. Uh, do you guys know about circular breathing for wind instruments? It's a it's a very cool technique that a lot of people can do. I my, I myself can't actually do it, um, but it's basically where we don't we we fill up our cheeks, yeah. and then we then we blow out with our mouths while we quickly inhale with our nose, and so it's an it's a way to just keep playing continuously without having to stop. Uh, it's really cool. I I can't do it myself. But <laughs> if you ever have a brass player, it's, who can. Uh, it's kind of my reason. Uh, a an instrument. Well, it's what they like is secure. Yeah. Yeah. No, it, it's a really it's it's very impressive. Um, often saxophonists uh, have an easy time with it. If you know, like, the famous like saxophonist Kenny G, he's like um, he has like the world record I think for the longest note ever held on an instrument. He like he like held a note for like four days or something like that. <laughs> Um, let me play, let me play this one other piece for you. So this is a, um, 
this is a little like album that I recorded uh, with just some friends when I uh, lived in 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 the state of Georgia. Um, and this is a, a guitarist named Killick, um, myself on trombone, and then a drummer named Steven. And yeah, it's just the three of us. And again, it, I do a lot of improvisation. So this is, again, we just sat down in a recording studio and improvised together. And this one track, I do a lot of different trombone techniques on. So I'll just play it. Uh, I'll just play it for you. Uh, and we'll see what you think. It's called Moo Yeah.
I'll, I'll pause it there. You, you can see, so we're, we're improvising, but I, I mean, those guys are, they're great to play with. The drummer, Stephen, is really great. The guitarist is really great. Um, you can see what we're doing is just trying to create kind of an arc of energy together. We're, we're just building intensity and trying to peak and then trying to come down together. And similar to like what I've been saying a lot uh, today is like trying to trying to have things like start in one place and grow and then become something new. So they don't always like go back to where they came from, but they kind of like they be they become a new thing. And that for me is what we're all, like this particular trio. I think I think we did a good job with some of these recordings of like just evolving these arcs together and like tr thinking about just building tension and building energy and letting things like evolve and grow. Um, so some of the effects that I was using, I forgot to mention, there's a really important effect for brass called multiphonics. So that's where we can actually play and sing at the same time. Cause we, we make the sound on our instruments by buzzing our lips, uh, but we can also sing uh, while we do that and we can make two notes at once. And it sounds like this. So it's pretty, it's fun. Um, generally, w we like to do it in the middle of our range. We'll play and we'll sing above the, so the, the, the bottom note will be the, the trombone note and the top note will be the voice note. Um, and a lot of, a lot of players can do it. You just, if you're working with a player, just make sure they're comfortable with the range, you know, have them look at it. But what's really fun is what I was just doing, you could probably hear were like, intervals like a fifth and a fourth and a, and a third when you get really close it can create beating so you know when you have sounds that are very close in pitch they can uh they can beat with each other and create destructive interference yes um yeah check with your individual performer about what they can do one thing i like to do is get really close and you'll hear the beats so it'll start going wah 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 So you could you could hear I was kind of coming in and out. Um, I was doing a lot of that on the, on that recording that we just listened to. Um, yeah, so th that's a fun. Multiphonics are really fun. It can expand from the unison to a big interval. Um. So that's always something fun to fun to play with. Um, any questions about multiphonics, or I, I can play something else for you. Good. <laughs> um, a lot of extended techniques. I think people are just interested in like new ways of making the sound kind of richer and noisier and more more kind of nuanced. Um, I think classically trained musicians spend a lot of time developing like a really pure, strong, consistent tone. But sometimes I think we get, uh, we get bored with that as, a sta as an ideal and we want to like do something more unique um, and that's less kind of normal. So uh, I think it's, just, it's fun to experiment with timbre uh, in, in composing and um, working with extended techniques to get all these different rich sounds and noisy sounds that again are kind of better at imitating our actual environment, I think. Um, oh, stop the share. Yes. Yeah, sorry. I've been sharing my screen the whole time. Um, let me actually, 
I want to play one more. What do I want to play? Oh, I'll do something. I, I made a, a little piece where I recorded myself um, using different intonation systems. Uh, and, and I made like a multi-track piece with a bunch of different trombone sounds uh, in different tuning relationships to each other. So I'll just play a little bit of that because uh, I think you might be interested in it. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to share one more time here, share the audio. Oh. So yeah, this is a, a piece, this is all me recorded on trombone, but a bunch of me layer uh, overdubbed on top.
I want to hear this live with like real concert with 10 performers in a big hall. That would be cool. That would be, yeah, that would be really cool. Um, it would probably be hard to, to maintain the, you'd probably have to, because when I recorded, I did a bunch of math, like all those notes were, um, I, I was really in, at the time I was really into uh, what we call just intonation, which I don't know if you guys have gotten into tuning, but um, you know, like the, on a piano keyboard, we've got equal temperament where every, there's 12 chromatic notes and they're all equally dis distanced from each other. But there have been all these different tuning systems throughout the history of music and Eastern, Western, different, different types of tuning. Um, and I was just doing a thing where I was using pure ratios like if uh, in in just intonation, all of the intervals are like really simple ratios of frequency, like like four to three or or two to three, or uh, five to four. Um, on in equal temperament, they're all kind of like adjusted a little bit to make it work. Um, but with just intonation, we use just like simple ratios. But I I just did a bunch of math where I like started with one pitch. And I kept doing different ratios to like generate more frequencies, but um, basically, if you like, if you like, do that in a bunch of different directions, they it becomes this whole dissonant kind of mass where they don't really like the notes don't really fit with each other. So it was just kind of an experiment. It wasn't very systematic. I just generated a bunch of different frequencies, and then I got in a recording studio with uh, with headphones and a tuner that allowed me to like very and you know because a trombone you can precisely put the slide at, at any exact point um so i just recorded a bunch of like really precise frequencies and then i just got in audacity on my computer and just started combining them and i didn't really have like a system i just kind of like did what sounded cool and just kind of experimented um so it would be hard to do live, but it it was cool. It was cool when we uh, when it was premiered at like a class concert. I did that during when I was doing a master's degree. Um, we uh, it was in surround sound with like really nice big speakers. So it was kind of like it was quite loud, and it kind of filled the hall. And the beating, what one thing I like so much about beating is that it makes the sound physical. You can like really feel. Uh, the wah 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 in, in the air. You can feel it on your eardrums. You can like feel it in your body. Um, and I was just trying to create like a just this really noisy, resonant, vibrating texture in the room, um, which I think brass instruments, you know, we're historically we're we're just all about like the big, loud, dominating kind of sound that we can produce. So I've with trombone, I'm always like experimenting more with different different ways of like creating a really cool trombone sound. So I'm glad you like that one. That's kind of a, I just kind of, I did that one in like a week. I was just kind of playing around. It was, sometimes our best, our best ideas are just like, uh, I, I rarely work that way. I rarely just like get in the studio and just like experiment with something and just make something. Um, usually with composing, I'm very, uh, I'll like have a bunch of plans and schemes and, and stuff, but um, sometimes we get really good results if we just try something and just do it and see what happens. And that's kind of what happened with that piece. But it sounded like really planned, like yeah. all, every <laughs> event was like, oh, right at the like, best time could happen. Thank, thank you. For, yeah, I mean, thank you. It was... So, <laughs> when, I, when, I was editing, when I was editing it together, I was just kind of making those choices almost like an improv, I was just kind of playing it. And if I at a moment where I was like, I need to get rid of that note and put a new note in, I just did it uh, based on what kind of felt, felt good in real time. So I think it worked. Sometimes I do the exact opposite. I'll have a whole scheme for like the form of the piece is like all these different sections and each section is gonna have this much material and it's gonna be like, there's all this like rhythmic structure and uh, sometimes I get really crazy about stuff like that. Um, but this was like a total opposite approach. So there's a lot of ways to do it. Well, I think that's probably all I have for y'all. Uh, Nassim, do you have any final closing thoughts or any questions uh, or anything from anybody? <laughs> I get sorely dot in. 
مشکلی هست من هم میتونم کمک کنم برای ترجمه okay. که همین که صدای مثل پیتزیکات رو داریم روی احساس اینجور صدا بودم Yeah, do you have any sound like pizzicato and strings on your instrument? That's a good question. Um, not, not really. Not, not, I mean, we can just play, we can just play a short note. Um, I can try to imitate it just with a, a, a staccato note. Um, but no, not, yeah, not, not so much. I think, I mean, I think low brass trombone and also tuba in the low range can kind of can kind of imitate that because because it could be very resonant. Um, but you sometimes... can't have like the kind of that gesture on the. That's one thing I can do. Again, that's that's when I take the mouthpiece out, and it's called a tongue ram. Uh, I can uh, take... just inhale in the instrument without. Sound, pitch sound. Well, that's what. Yeah, with the tongue ram, I'm just like, I'm, 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 I'm hitting the, the tube with my tongue. And it, it doesn't really have a pitch, but it has that kind of whoop, sound. So that's probably the best I could do for pizzicato. Thank you. And the microtone, you can play all of the microtone on your instruments. Oh yes, yeah. So trombone is very good for the uh, trombone and string instruments are great. And glissando is common in your instrument. Yep. Yeah. Oh yes. Yeah, we like we like glissandos, and the pedal range is very nice. is fun with glissandos. Yeah. So if I get pedal on it, we pedal to the cast range of the saws me out pointer. No trumpet, I'm between the shows and a trumpet. I'm had to meet on a bus bus to give an hour under the yoke top, had to dog top and pointer as range of the saws. And what I really like coming from Iran, hearing like brass as well, um, the it would be really nice to show how soft this instrument can be, even without any, any mute. Absolutely, yeah. And it's, it is a challenge, but w the trombone can be very beautiful and lyrical, like... It's, it's, it's not super quiet. I, I, some players can get even quieter. If I really tried to play as quiet as I possibly could. It's actually kind of hard to, to maintain the pitch. Um, but it can be a very, it can have a very kind of feathered, airy, soft tone. Um, especially brass uh, chords. I think uh, low brass, especially trombone and tubas are just really beautiful when you have like a harmony, like a trombone, like a three trombones and a tuba, like an orchestra section, uh, really soft, really close harmony can just be this like, it's almost like a synthesizer pad or something, just this like really lush kind of backdrop to a sound. Um, so yeah, d that's a great point. Nassim. Don't, don't just, I mean, brass can definitely be loud and punchy. Um, but a, a lot of French composers, I think used brass very soft, uh, very like, um, I think Debussy has, is it the, what is it? The clouds, the nuages, the, the Debussy piece. It's a, it's a famous orchestra piece that has a lot of brass. Um, I think I'm remembering it's nu nuages, which is clouds. Um, you can probably find a recording on YouTube. Yeah. They have a bunch of like muted brass 
beautiful harmonies and uh, very quiet. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> Well, this has been really, really fun. Thank you so much, Nassim, for inviting me. You guys are doing great work, and I just think this is so cool that Nassim has put this class together inter international um, through the internet during a pandemic. I mean, it's just, it's, it's, it's wild, but it's, it's amazing uh, that we're all able to come together and talk about music and make music together. So thank you so much for having me today. I look Thank forward to coming. Yeah, I look forward to, uh, to a month uh, on September 20th, the final concert. Yay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'll be there. Thank you. Okay. Excellent. Be awesome. Yeah. Yay. <laughs> cool. Okay, cool. Nice.